Welcome to the Journal. On his victory tour of Iraq and Afghanistan last week, President George Bush stopped in Kabul to tell President Karzai that he could count on us no matter who's in the White House. It's in our interest, he said, that Afghanistan's democracy flourish. What President Bush didn't say was that democracy is on life support there, bleeding slowly to death from internal wounds. Despite the $200 billion the United States has already spent in Afghanistan, this has been the deadliest year for our forces since the war began seven years ago. Despite the presence of 31,000 American troops in the country, Osama bin Laden is still on the loose. The Taliban insurgents control much of the territory, and Afghans supply the world with over 90% of its opium. If anything's flourishing in Afghanistan, it's the poppy. And where in all this is the government installed in power by the United States and supported by our troops and taxpayers? There's the rub. In this article in the Washington Post, Sarah Shea says Afghanistan's government is corrupt and abusive and is driving its people back into the arms of the Taliban fundamentalists. Sarah Shays went to Afghanistan to report for National Public Radio just a few weeks after 9-11. She reported from some of the most dangerous areas and then decided to stay on as a private citizen. She's been running a co-op employing Afghan men and women to produce skin care products. She also wrote this book, The Punishment of Virtue, Inside Afghanistan After the Taliban. Welcome back to the journal. It's great to be here. Your article in the Washington Post paints a devastating picture. The Taliban insurgents are making headway again because the government we support is a gang of corrupt gunslingers feared as much by everyday people as the Taliban themselves. Yeah, that's uh, about the size of it. And this is what American soldiers are dying for there? You know, our democracy is famous for one thing in particular, is checks and balances. That was the genius of the American system. Rule of law. Rule of law, but also recourse. If one branch of government is abusing you, you've got other branches of government that you can turn to. And Afghanistan? Doesn't. So what we've really done is set up a kind of monopoly on the exercise of power. I mean, it's the opposite of what everything that we consider to be democracy. We've allowed an abusive concentration of power in the hands of, in particular, the executives, be it, you know, in particular on a local level, like the provincial governors and their acolytes. Because we've convinced ourselves, and often we have to, we, by we I mean us and our NATO allies, have to convince our own um, public opinion that this is a democratically elected representative government of Afghanistan in order to justify the sacrifices in money and troops and things like that. But the Afghans see it differently. The Afghans say, you brought these people in here. You, we repudiate... You mean the Afghans at the, low, at, at the local level, it. the people where you work, right? Ordinary people. And they all are telling me, you brought these people back into Afghanistan. We had repudiated them in the early 1990s. We knew what these people are. They're... Warlords, right? Yeah. Cri the criminal yeah, class. Exactly. So you brought them in, and now you're backing them up and you are making it impossible for us to make our voices heard and to have any leverage on the behavior of these people. This is what leaped out at me as I read your piece. The Pakistani military, you say, is using the Taliban from over the border to gain a foothold in Afghanistan, and the only reason it's succeeding is, quote, the appalling behavior of Afghan officials. You know, the last time I saw President Karzai, when I said, Mr. President, I can't walk out my door without seeing a member of your government abusing one of your citizens. And it, it really is the case. You see a police officer, you know, kick out the back um, light of one of these little rickshaws, these putt-putt little rickshaws that are like the taxis in Kandahar. You know, it stops at a restricted place. Instead of just saying, could you please move along, they go running behind it and kick out the back light. Then you've got, for example, one of my cooperative members was, um, her electricity was cut by a jealous family member, so she needed a new electricity account. She needed to get a meter. She goes to the electricity department, is told there are no meters. You can't, nobody can open a new account. But but then she finds out from her, um, you know, the little linesman, well, if you pay me 600 bucks, you know, I can set up a meter for you. So then I go to the, electric the head of the electricity dep department and I say, she needs a meter. She gets a meter. Hmm. So it's, it's, com 
no recourse. It's no recourse. You quote a woman in your co-op, I think it's in your co-op, who talks about it's like standing on a watermelon? Two watermelons, one foot on one and the other on the other. She says, the, you know, the Taliban shake us down at night, but the government shakes us down in the, day, in the daytime. And I, I was recently sitting with a group of tribal elders, and they put it this way, these are, you know, dignified elderly gentlemen with their beards and turbans, and they start hitting themselves. The Taliban hit us on this cheek, and the government hits us on this cheek. That, that's how they felt. We don't know if Barack Obama understands this is what is happening in Afghanistan. But we do know that the president-elect is talking about sending another 20,000 troops to Afghanistan on top of the 31,000 who are already there. Are troops going to make any difference? You know, we do need more troops. And let me just remind you that the number of troops on the ground per population is, the, is pretty much the lowest of any U.S. Uh, post-conflict involvement since World War II. And at this point, the Taliban kind of military campaign plan is effective enough that, you know, you do need troops to prevent them from making military uh, encroachments that are really dangerous. You also need troops to protect the population from the Taliban. There are people who don't like the Taliban but may kind of knuckle under to them because on the one hand the government isn't doing anything better for them and the Taliban are going to kill them if, if, if they don't um, visibly divide themselves away from the government. So you need to be able to protect people from that kind of an intimidation campaign and that takes troops. For example, a battalion commander in any province is interacting with the governor of that province on a probably weekly basis. If that battalion commander becomes more aware of some of the um, ways that that governor is abusing the population and brings it up to the governor, he can start using his leverage, and he's got a lot, to demand better behavior on the part of the governor. And so that's one way that I think that the military, and this is, this is iconoclastic because people say, oh, the military shouldn't get involved in governance and things like that. But the Afghans are actually looking to us to Ask some questions, some accountability questions. Why did you do this? Or I hear that you are about to take a large swath of land that belongs to the so-and-so tribe and hand it out to your cronies. Uh, why are you doing this? See, the way it works now is if a military commander is only interacting with the governor about killing Taliban, he's got his arm around the governor. The governor helps him to kill 10 Taliban. But the governor's behavior is actually creating 30 Taliban uh, over here, you're actually at a deficit. And that military commander would do better to ask the governor a little bit more about how he's governing and handle the killing the Taliban part himself. You know that there are a lot of respectable people in this country, in the military and in foreign affairs, who question the logic of our being there, period. I mean, that if Obama dials back our presence in Iraq while increasing our presence in Afghanistan, he's buying into the global war of terror mantra that the Bush administration has been pushing. There is a direct, a direct link between Afghanistan and 9-11. Um, I don't think Afghanistan is an isolated um, place. Afghanistan is very connected to its neighbors, in particular yeah. to Pakistan. I don't think that we can afford to leave this region alone to fester. Uh, I is also... the Pakistan military supporting yes. the Taliban? Yes. And I mean, our ally in Pakistan, we expect precisely. to fight the terrorists, are supporting the terrorists precisely. in... Precisely. So we need to get the knots out of our foreign policy here. It's very perplexing to Afghans to understand that we are providing a billion dollars a year to the Pakistani military, which is creating the Taliban. That's the other thing they don't understand. And they say, wait a second, are you with them or against them? This is something I've been beating my head against for the last seven years. I, it has been obvious to me that the Pakistani military intelligence agency has been... Uh, basically creating, orchestrating this so-called Taliban resurgence for the last, you know, I mean, since, since the end of 2001. Yeah. So why are we paying Pakistan a billion dollars a year? And they've been fooling us, you know, with a well-timed delivery of an al-Qaeda operative. Um, and that really had us fooled for a number of years until incontrovertible intelligence demonstrated that the ISI was behind the bombing of the Indian embassy in Kabul a few months ago. And then it was, uh-oh, they really are doing this. And, and this is after years of U.S. military officers watching, you know, I know somebody who 
was mentoring the Afghan National Army and um, was looking for where he can, you know, set up some uh, operating posts for or outposts right. for the Afghan National Army along the border. And he chose a couple of pieces of high ground. He goes outside with his field glasses and he finds the Pakistani army in those pieces of high ground inside Afghanistan with Taliban training camps at the foot of the hills. And the, these are things that have been going on for several years. And I think I think that we're finally copping to them. So we need to realign our policy, I think. What do you mean realign? It's, let's, all right, let's, let's, let's play that game. Okay. Suppose it's the 21st of January, 